well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to start the morning session. Uh, we'll have several talks on observational appearance and evolution of neutron stars, and we start with a presentation by Samar Safiharp on the observational diversity and evolution. The microphone. Yeah. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning, uh, and uh, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to be here today to highlight the observational diversity of neutron stars. Uh, since we are celebrating 50 years of Pulsar's discovery, I thought I'll start with a very brief historical introduction and notes on the uh, discovery of Pulsar's and on the growing observational diversity. Uh, and then I'll focus on the subclasses of neutron stars, uh, which have extreme magnetic fields, extreme in comparison to the Crab Pulsar, namely magnetars, high-B radio pulsars, and central compact objects, or CCOs. And then I'll highlight the growing body of evidence uh, from observations that this distinction is blurred and that we can probably explain it uh, uh, even with the help of supernova remnants by magnetic field evolution. Um, just yesterday, we heard from Pat, or on Tuesday, we heard from Pat on how do we use SNRs to address fundamental properties about neutron stars, in particular, neutron star kicks and neutron star cooling. And today, I'm going to focus on the topic of magnetic field evolution, including the importance of magnetic field growth. Um, and towards the end of my talk, um, if time allows, I will touch very briefly on the topic of connecting the diversity of neutron stars to the diversity of core collapse supernovae, which make neutron stars. So we all know that pulsars were discovered in 1967 in the radio by Jocelyn Bell and Anthony Huish. And a year later, uh, the Crab Pulsar and the Vela Pulsar were discovered in their respective SNRs, proving uh, Baden's Wiki's 1934 prediction that supernovae make neutron stars. And it's thanks to radio studies as well as imaging X-ray satellites such as Einstein in the 80s and Rosat and Aska in the 90s that we started to understand how these rotation-powered pulsars, or RPPs, power pulsar wind nebulae. And we'll hear about pulsar wind nebulae later today. Um, at the same time, there was significant uh, growth in, the, in studying accretion-powered pulsars, which I won't address in my talk. And in the 90s, uh, there was a surge in studying the anomalous X-ray pulsars and the soft gamma ray repeaters, which were later united under the family of magnetars, particularly thanks to the RXTE satellite. And it's worth noting that the term unusual class of X-ray pulsars was first uh, introduced in a paper by Sandro Meraghetti. This is a page, picture taken at this meeting, not in 1995, um, uh, saying that this is an unusual class of pulsars, unusual at the time because they have spectra very soft in comparison to the accretion power pulsars. At the same time, their X-ray luminosity exceeds their rotational energy loss, and therefore they cannot be powered by uh, rotation. Now, also the term magnetar uh, and AXP have been first coined in 1992 and 95, respectively, by these two gentlemen. And in the past decade, uh, thanks to more radio studies and particularly the Chandra X-ray telescope, we have started to learn a lot about this growing classes of neutron stars, namely the high B radio pulsars with magnetic field exceeding the QED value and possibly uh, behaving as magnetars, and the central compact objects or CCOs typified by the Cassiopeia A uh, CCO, which are now dubbed as anti-magnetars or hidden magnetars. So we are now in the era of, instead of talking about these as different classes of neutron stars, we're attempting to unify these different classes. And I've already told you who coined the term magnetar and AXP, so I have a 
question for you. Do you know who coined the term CCO? Yes. Well done. <laughs> so, um, so I guess I was I wasn't sure about that. So, uh, so it was uh, the first instance I saw was in a footnote buried in your 2000 uh, paper, which says according to the convention recommended by the Chandra Science Center, the Cassiopeia A CCO, which was following the first Chandra light observations of the supernova remnant should be named CXO with the coordinates. And we use the abbreviation CCO for brief T for that particular one and the name stuck. So he's the one to be blamed for that name. <laughs> uh, so the main question is, can we explain the apparent diversity of neutron stars by one, their magnetic field evolution, and also by the diversity of core collapse supernova making uh, neutron stars, as well as the different environments in which they evolve. And what I'm going to focus on is telling you how the hosting SNRs uh, provide a totally independent way of answering this fundamental question. So going back to Pulsar 101 uh, characteristics, where pulsars land on the PP dot diagram, as you know, is determined primarily by their period and period derivative, which gives us the rotational energy lossy dot. And if we have a measurement of P double dot, then we get the uh, measurement of the breaking index N given in this formula. And under the important assumption that we have a constant magnetic field and a constant breaking index, we get this expression for the true age of the pulsar as a function of PP dot, as well as the initial spin period P0 and the breaking index. And I'll get back to this formula as I go along. So also under the important assumption that the rotational energy loss goes into magnetic dipole radiation, n equals 3, then we get these two famous formulae for the dipole surface dipole magnetic field as a function of PP dot and the characteristic age as a function of PP dot as well, which then lead to those lines of constant magnetic field and lines of constant spin down age on the PP dot diagram, which here shows the diversity of neutron stars, with this line illustrating the lifetime of supernova remnants, which means that objects above this line are expected to be associated with supernova remnants. So to show you the diversity, we have the rotation powered pulsars, RPPs, with magnetic fields clusters around 10 to the 12 gauss, like the crab, the magnetars on the top right corner with magnetic fields exceeding the QED value, and the high B pulsars with magnetic fields similarly high, but intermediate between the RPPs and magnetars, and the CCOs, which land on the opposite end in terms of magnetic field, which are dubbed as anti-magnetars and typified by Cas A, but this is Cas 79, uh, which has a measured uh, period for its CCO, period and period derivative. So this is an illustration of the diversity on the PP dot diagram. Here I want to show another version. Uh, here you have the period as a function of the surface dipole magnetic field. Is dying. The battery is decaying. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, and so this is again showing this diversity where the magnetars and CCOs on, on the other side uh, with respect to the ro rotation power pulsars. And the point here is that we can measure the magnetic field differently. Instead of using timing measurements, we can use cyclotron features as done for the accretion power pulsars or high mass X-ray binaries to infer directly the magnetic field, which does not necessarily have to be the dipolar component. And that's important because it gives us uh, insights on the magnetic field topology. So very briefly on these classes of uh, neutron stars with extreme magnetic fields, magnetars, we heard great talks on Monday about magnetars. So I'll just skip this and just say that traditionally these are discovered as high energy X-ray and gamma ray objects, and they are not supposedly uh, power, uh, powering pulsar wind nebulae. And even though they're believed to be relatively young objects, we only have a very handful of associations with SNRs. We have about two dozens of magnetars, but only about five 
uh, associations with uh, supernova remnants, which is a problem for studying magnetic field evolution, as I'll show you later. In terms of the CCOs, and we'll hear about CCOs more later today uh, from DeLuca. So as the name indicates, these are associated with supernova remnants. So by definition, they must be relatively young objects. They, are, they peak in the X-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum with mostly no counterparts at other wavelengths. And uh, very importantly, and they don't have any pulsar wind nebula around them, and the uh, timing analysis of three CCOs in the three SNRs shown here, CAS79, PAPIS A, and PKS1209, show that PP dot imply a, a surface dipole magnetic field very low between 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 Gauss, and that's where the name anti-magnetars came from. And at the same time, interestingly, spectroscopically, this magnetic field is consistent with that determined from timing uh, measurements, uh, such as, for example, modeling the surface thermal emission from the Cassiopeia A uh, CCO, as well as finding cyclotron features uh, in uh, the two CCOs in PAPIS A and PKS1209, indicating relatively low magnetic fields of the order of 10 to the 11 Gauss. These are quiet X-ray emitters, except for this very odd, interesting object CCO in the supernova remnant RCW-103, which we'll hear about uh, later today from DeLuca. So moving now to blurring this diversity from observations. So I'll start with the observational evidence for this neutron star diversity being blurred. First of all, the discovery of magnetar-like behavior from two rotation power pulsars, which happen to be high-B pulsars. These are the pulsar high-B uh, pulsar J1846 in the very young supernova remnant KES75 and the pulsar high-B pulsar J1119 in the supernova remnant G2. 92 minus 0.5, slightly older, and these two pulsars happen to fall here on the PP dot diagram close to the magnetars in terms of their magnetic fields. So um, these outbursts were discovered uh, in 2006, or the outburst uh, occurred in 2006 for this guy and 10 years later for J1119 very recently. But these outbursts, magnetar-like outbursts, illustrated the fact that rotation-powered pulsars, these are uh, believed to be powered by rotation and they power pulsar wind nebulae, um, they can be occasionally powered by uh, magnetic energy as well, not just rotation. Now, on the other hand, magnetars can also display properties similar to the other classes of neutron stars, uh, namely the discovery of transient uh, pulse radio emission from some magnetars, and excitingly, the uh, discovery of a pulsar wind nebula or magnetar wind nebula around this uh, magnetar, possibly associated with supernova remnant W41. And uh, also the discovery of what's called low magnetic field uh, magnetars. These are three um, pulsars which have a measurement of P much lower than the QD, QED value, basically blurring uh, the common assumption that magnetars are associated with high B pulsars, but rather can be associated with uh, pulsars with a dipolar field very similar to traditional radio pulsars. So that was highlights from the observational evidence of the diversity being blurred. Now moving to some theoretical work that attempts to unify the subclasses of neutron stars. And this is a plot resulting from great work by Vicano et al., which attempts to unify the different subclasses here, magnetars, the X-ray dim isolated neutron stars, which we'll hear about later today, high-B radio pulsars and rotation-powered pulsars uh, using a magnetothermal evolution model. So what you're seeing here on the PP dot diagram uh, curves uh, that correspond to different values of the magnetic field ranging from 3 times 10 to the 12 to uh, about 10 to the 15 Gauss. And these lines, these dashed lines are lines of constant magnetic field, but these lines take into account the evolution of both the temperature as well as magnetic field decay. So this study shows the importance of coupling the temperature and magnetic field evolution, and particularly the Hall effect for magnetars in order to unify these subclasses. Now, what I'm going to describe next is what I said I'll focus on is that supernova remnants can provide an independent means to address magnetic field 
evolution. And uh, the work I'm going to show next uh, is done in collaboration with my postdoc, Adam Rogers, who's shown here. So to perform the study, we collected a sample of pulsar SNR associations, again focusing on those extreme magnetic field subclasses, magnetars, AXPs, and SGRs, uh, high B pulsars, and CCOs. And to that, we added two rotation-powered pulsars with measured breaking low breaking indices. And we do that because we wanted to compare to a study done by Win Ho, who considered magnetic field growth in young rotation-powered pulsars. But for this sample, it's very small sample, really limited. But that's because we decided to uh, focus on just the secure associations and those that have a measured supernova remnant age because we want to use this age as a constraint as the true pulsar age. And so these are the properties of the pulsars. These are the associated SNRs. And these are the ranges of the SNR ages. And all these properties are compiled and uh, try our best to keep them up to date in the high energy catalog of supernova remnant developed at the University of Manitoba. So one thing to note is the huge age discrepancy, as you all know, in CCOs uh, between the characteristic ages of pulsars and their much younger supernova remnants. Another interesting one is the anomalous X-ray pulsar uh, 2259 in the supernova remnant CTB109, where also the characteristic age is way higher, orders of magnitude higher. So you remember this formula that I showed uh, at the beginning of my talk, which makes the assumption that the magnetic field and N are constant. Now, what I'm going to do here, I reordered this expression, where here we have the initial spin period expressed as a function of PP dot, which are measured, the age, the true age of the pulsar, and the breaking index. And here we're going to use these SNR associations to constrain the age for the pulsar. And if we do that, then we can plot P0 over P as a function of the uh, breaking index and look for the allowed values that are constrained by this SNR age. And these are shown in these gray shaded areas. So the first thing to note is that P0 over P is actually not necessarily much smaller than 1. These are two, S, uh, two AXPs and two SGRs associated with supernova remnants. And this is contrary to the common assumption that P0 has to be much smaller than P, uh, especially for the magnetar model. The other observation to make is that for these two high B pulsars, in some cases, we have a measurement of the breaking index, which is an additional constraint. And in this case, at least, and another case that Pat showed on Tuesday for G292, for example, the index, the index required, the breaking index required by constraining the age of the pulsar by its associated SNR is not consistent with the one measured. So there is a problem there. In other words, we are unable to explain the observed breaking index and enforce the ages to be equal with a constant n, implying the need for a time-dependent magnetic field, which is uh, expressed here. This is the equatorial uh, field as a function of time with this function, which takes into account uh, the time evolution. And if you assume a time-dependent magnetic field, then the breaking index will have this expression with f dot here. Um, and for n to be smaller than 3, we have seen that the measure breaking indices for many pulsars are smaller than 3. If n is smaller than 3, then f dot has to be positive, which means that uh, the function f, uh, the field is growing. Now, talking, moving to the subject of magnetic field growth, this is not uh, a very a new idea. In fact, it started being investigated shortly after the discovery of neutron stars, including work done by uh, Zeldovich, who's shown here. I took a picture of, uh, of him here in the hallway. And, um, and the submergence of magnetic field due to fallback accretion has been investigated by a number of authors in the 90s. And it's just recently revived due to a number of observational facts by a number of authors. Some of them have given talks here at this conference, including our chair here of this session. Um, so this uh, magnetic field growth has been revived because 1 and, like I mentioned, like I mentioned is smaller than 3. Uh, we know that the magnetic field is very small from both timing as well as spectroscopic measurement. And in the case of CAS79, the presence of a highly modulated 
pulse signal implies that there must be a, a much higher internal magnetic field, suggesting that these are born with high internal magnetic field. And if there's fallback accretion, it takes time for that to emerge to the surface. And uh, so this is how uh, we describe the, uh, the submergence of the magnetic field with time. And so um, using that sample of pulsar SNR associations that I showed you, that very limited sample that we focus on, we developed empirical parametric models uh, for uh, describing their evolution um, based on previously developed uh, models by a number of authors. Um, and this is an attempt to unify the magnetic field growth and decay. This is the expression for the magnetic field decay, uh, which is based on models developed by Kolpe and elaborated on by Daloso and applied by Nakono to explain the age discrepancy for the anomalous X-ray pulsar 1E2259 in CTB109. So magnetar or AXPs at least require magnetic field decay for these time scales. Now, based on that parametric expression, we develop a parametric model for magnetic field uh, growth, which actually uh, takes into account also previous work done on uh, magnetic field which are buried under the crust. And um, we explore the flexibility of this model, which is parameterized similarly to the DK models by trying to reproduce the results uh, obtained from previous work on buried magnetic field in young neutron stars, particularly using a magnetic field decay by these authors, and also reproducing the results of Win Ho, who studied magnetic field growth in both young rotation pul uh, pulsars with low breaking indices, as well as CCOs. And these are the, um, uh, the solutions to the field evolution in that sample, very limited sample. I describe what you're seeing here is the characteristic age of the pulsar as a function of the characteristic, uh, as a function of the age of the SNR. And this gray area describes the joint fit to the anomalous X-ray pulsars using the magnetic field decay. The blue curves correspond to solutions for the three CCOs using magnetic field growth. And the late time evolution of this characteristic age in the case of the three CCOs actually explains the huge age discrepancy with their associated SNRs. In particular, if you see these lines intersect the line where the pulsar equals to the SNR ages at times that exceed 10 to the 4.5 years or so, which means by that time, the supernova remnants would have dissipated. In other words, the characteristic ages for these pulsars considered will never reflect the true ages as long as they're inside their supernova remnants. Now, showing these same evolutionary models on the PP dot diagram, and I'm focusing again here on those blue curves, which describe magnetic field growth. So the assumption here is that the magnetic field will emerge on a certain time scale, and then it will reach this asymptotic value. This asymptotic value varies between the uh, models or the CCOs considered. And, but however, this suggests that CCOs can be ancestors of other older classes. If the magnetic field lands on uh, the high magnetic field value, they could be ancestors of the X-ray dim isolated neutron stars. But if they land on the lower end, they could be ancestors of um, the older population of radio pulsars, as long as they survive the accretion phase, which should be X-ray dominated phase, and the magnetic field that emerges is high enough for uh, radio emission to occur. So in summary, what I told you is that our model, even though it's just a parametric simplistic model, supports the idea that these uh, apparently different classes of neutron stars are actually united through magnetic field evolution. So moving to the second and much briefer part uh, of my talk is about connecting the diversity of neutron stars to the diversity of core collapse explosions. And we heard about uh, supernovae explosion mechanisms and supernova remnants uh, in talks on Tuesday. Um, there are 
some interesting questions to address. What I'm showing here is the old historical classification of supernovae based on their optical spectra. And we're interested here in uh, core collapse uh, supernovae, which are shown here with the sub different subtypes, eventually implying different progenitor masses, with mass uh, progenitor masses going higher to the left in this case. And some questions I'm particularly interested in is which types of supernovae make magnetars and even CCOs? And the fundamental question, what type of explosion made the Crab Nebula? How much time do I have? Five. So I'm going to just skip um, the part on magnetars and high B pulsars because I want to show you something interesting from Hitomi on studying uh, the Crab Nebula. So um, I started with the Crab, and I'm going to end with the Crab. The crab is our poster child for a core collapse explosion. Despite that, we still do not understand the explosion. When viewed as a supernova remnant, it has an uncomfortably very low mass, ejecta mass of about 4.5 solar masses, and very low kinetic energy of about less than 10 to the 50 ergs. Moreover, the shell, the supernova remnant shell, expected from this explosion is still missing. Despite deep searches for that shell, in radio and in x-rays, none was found. Where is it? We call them the shell-less uh, supernova remnants. And there's about two dozens of these in our galaxy. So uh, two scenarios have been proposed in the literature. First, we have a typical iron core collapse, 10 to the 51 Earth's explosion. Um, and the only thing is the shell is there. It's just way beyond the pulsar wind nebula, and it must be carrying a lot of the mass and the kinetic energy. But like I said, despite deep searches for that shell, it's still not there. And the other interesting scenario, which was proposed in the 80s by Nomoto et al., is that this is an anomalous explosion to start with. I mean, we're starting to believe that the crab is anomalous anyways to start with. And that explosion in this case is a low energy, 10 to the 50 ergs, resulting here in an electron capture supernova, as opposed to the typical assumed iron core collapse explosion. So what did we do with Hitomi to address this important uh, question? Um, as you know, Hitomi is a Japanese-led X-ray mission. And uh, this mission had uh, three detectors on it, spanning a wide uh, X-ray band. But the most important one was the microcalorimeter, or the soft X-ray spectrometer, which has an unprecedented uh, sensitivity, uh, a spectral resolution of about five electron volt, and sensitivity to thermal X-rays. And this mission was successfully launched in February 2016, thus the smiley face. However, six weeks later, the mission ended, unfortunately, during six weeks later. Oh, sorry, yeah, that should be 2016. That's a wishful thinking. Uh, during those six weeks, um, very brief uh, time, uh, there were a number of observations performed of the Perseus cluster, amazing results done there. And there were three observations performed, uh, very brief observations, I would say snapshots, which are part of the calibration program. And that includes the crab just before the end of the mission life. The observation was very brief. Here, I just want to acknowledge the contributions to the Hitomi mission. Here, I'm just showing a picture of the partial team shown here. Uh, but the, um, the spectrum shown here with the soft X-ray spectrometer or the microcalometer, um, unfortunately, was only from 2 to 12 keV. That is, we were missing the soft X-ray band, which was the interesting band, because the gate valve was closed. And that was because we were early in the phase of the mission. So we didn't have any counts below 2 keV, but this is the spectrum in just 10 kiloseconds, more than 550,000 counts. And the observation was pointing towards the center of the nebula, unfortunately or fortunately, depending what you're interested in. Um, so 
there was unfortunately no evidence of any line emission in the spectrum despite uh, searching using different methods. But a new upper limit, a very stringent upper limit on the X-ray emitting mass has been obtained of about one solar mass. That was obtained actually uh, making use also of previous uh, Chandra observations dedicated to look for that thermal X-ray emission. And that was done for a wide range of assumed shell radii and plasma temperature and ionization time scales. So no thermal X-ray emission, but we have a new upper limit or a stringent upper limit on the X-ray emitting mass. So going back to our two scenarios that I mentioned um, in terms of explaining the explosion mechanism, we explored the parameter space for these explosions using hydrodynamical simulations developed by Lee et al. And these two explosion mechanisms I remind you are the iron core collapse 10 to the 51 ergs versus the electron capture 10 to the 50 ergs here on the right side. And we explore two different environments, the interstellar medium uniform ISM to the top and a progenitor wind to the bottom. And the bottom line is that even though the electron captured low energy explosion has been favored by a number of studies, this result does not rule out yet an iron core collapse 10 to the 51 ergs energy explosion, as long as we believe an extremely low density for the interstellar medium, less than 0.03 particles per cubic centimeter, which is lower than in the case of the electron capture. And the only way to distinguish between these two models is really to have pointings away from that nebula so we can distinguish between the two because they have different predictions. And that was going to happen next, but the mission ended. So to summarize, we have gone a long way since the discovery of the Crab and Vela pulsars now 50 years ago. The diversity is blurred with growing observational and theoretical work. And the unification is getting closer and closer when we consider magnetic field evolution, in particular uh, magnetic field growth for the younger uh, population of neutron stars, in particular CCOs. Uh, the magnetic field topology is also very important. I didn't have time to talk about this, but this was covered in a number of talks at this meeting. But one thing I should note is that the toroidal component of the magnetic field is extremely important. It has been shown both theoretically and observationally that it can explain the diversity of uh, neutron stars. In particular, uh, theoretical work done here uh, stresses the importance of a toroidal field in explaining magnetar-like behavior from low magnetic field pulsars, as well as the anti-correlation between magnetar outbursts and the age of the system. And observations, whether um, from cyclotron features, indicate the presence of very strong toroidal components, either on the surface of neutron stars or inside the neutron star. Moving on to future prospects, so the loss of the Hitomi mission was a huge blow for X-ray astronomy. However, we have a number of missions recently launched or about to be launched. Erosita, we'll hear about that uh, later in the session. But this is going to be very important because it's going to help us expand that extremely limited sample of pulsar SNR associations. And on top of that, hopefully it will allow us to discover X-rays, softer X-rays or weaker X-rays from the uh, CCO descendants. And that's going to be very important to address magnetic field evolution. Timing measurements, very important still. We have a very limited uh, sample for uh, breaking index measurements. We're still missing breaking indices for these interesting classes of neutron stars. It might be a hopeless thing, but um, if the dipole indeed emerges to the surface, there might be some signature there that we can detect with a, a breaking index. And um, RxDE is gone. We have SWIFT. But also, India launched AstroSat two years ago. And just this past month, NASA launched NICER, the Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. And China launched the Hard X-ray Modulation Telescopes, which can address some of the science. And last but not least, high-resolution X-ray spectroscopy, which we tasted with a very brief, very brief phase of Hitomi. This is going to be important because, one, for this particular science, it will allow a direct measurement of the magnetic field, not just the dipolar component from cyclotron features, as well as in terms of the uh, SNR associations, it will allow us, one, to refine the ages, 
and two, to constrain the progenitors of these objects from accurate abundance measurements and comparing them to nucleosynthesis models, and then address the diversity of neutron stars to the diversity of uh, supernovae, core collapse supernovae. So um, now NASA and JAXA are committed to launching a recovery mission, the X-ray astronomy recovery mission, also referred to as CHARM, Astro H2, by 2021, followed by ESA's Athena, and hopefully uh, NASA's LINCS in 2028 and beyond. So, um, so the future is bright, and let's hope for another 50 years of great neutron star science, but for people for my, like myself, I just hope to make it to 2054, because that's the 1,000th anniversary of the crap, uh, supernova 1054. And uh, while on the topic of uh, celebrations, I learned this week that uh, Dick Manchester, is Dick here? Nope. Just celebrated a big birthday. And when I looked at ADS, I noticed that his publications go back to 50 years ago. So I thought we'll use this as an opportunity to wish him a happy birthday and thank him for all his great contributions to pulsar astronomy literally the past 50 years, in particular this uh, pulsar catalog, which is a great service to the pulsar community. Thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, we have uh, time for a couple of questions. About Crab Supernova, yeah. in addition to remnants, one should, one can look into historical light curves, and we tried to do this with Nozomo Tominaga and the same Ken Nomoto in APJ recently, and there is no hope to have standard 10 to 51 or just very right. low energy is okay. Another short uh, historical comment, the diversity of remnants was suggested again by Shklovsky, to study the diversity of explosions in different galaxies. In yes. this way, he predicted 87A would be blue supergenic. Right. Thank you for pointing that out. And uh, I didn't get the chance to talk about the observational evidence for supporting the low energy explosion for the crab, but yeah, the abundances is one of them and historical light curves. Uh, how can you uh, plan to make the direct uh, measurements of magnetic fields? What do you mean? Which measurements? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, uh, you plan to make uh, direct uh, measurements of magnetic fields? Uh, direct measurements of magnetic fields. I mean, not just me, a lot of observers do. <laughs> so um, it's actually based on, again, that's why I showed this one. So it's really based on cyclotron features, which have been used as a way to infer directly the magnetic field. So that was a method used for high mass X-ray binaries. And in the case of the isolated neutron stars, there is evidence for cyclotron features with where one of the interpretation, and a lot of this work was done by George and collaborators, is that um, there is evidence of cyclotron lines that imply a magnetic field of a certain value. Uh, for the low magnetic fields, this falls in the X-ray regime, uh, and if it's a proton cyclotron line, it would indicate a magnetar strength, or 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 Gauss magnetic field. So the uh, quick answer is cyclotron features. No, I mean, we, we make an assumption, but, yeah. Okay, I think we'll uh, move it to the coffee break, and please, the final question. Uh, thanks, Simon. Uh, uh, nice talk, especially the last bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a question, though. How, um, how do you rule out the possibility that these uh, CCOs were, were born with a uh, long period to explain the characteristic age discrepancy. How can we rule out that CCOs are born with long periods? Uh, I mean, we, it's, a, it's certainly a, a possibility that they are 
born with uh, long periods. I guess the question is whether they're born more with uh, higher or lower magnetic fields. Um, so I was focusing on the fact that the magnetic field, they can be born with a magnet, high magnetic field, but it's very deep interior, uh, and then it emerges on a certain time scale. But the initial period has to be close to the uh, current period. Does, does that answer your question? Well, Are you looking for observational evidence for that, or, or I tests? think it's a, uh, it's a possibility you can't rule out. So I don't... Um, it seems to me it's not necessary to invoke field growth. Even the, the breaking indices less than three can be explained if the breaking is due to a stellar wind. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, I, uh, I did not discuss that, and we do discuss it in our uh, paper, but um, I totally agree that in this very... <laughs> Where is it? See that? Faint note relativistic winds imply n smaller than 3. So for the ones that have pulsar wind nebula in particular, relativistic winds should be considered and they can explain. So actually follow up work on the sample that we did that I didn't even discuss is trying to constrain the luminosities uh, using the luminosities of these objects that have pulsar wind nebula and a measured breaking index in terms of the uh, the, the contribution of the, low, the relativistic wind to this. So yeah, that's definitely very important. But in the case of the objects like CCOs and magnetars in general, we don't see uh, pulsar wind nebula around them. So the effect of the wind, relativistic wind, is not that important there as for the rotation powered pulsars, for example, and the high B pulsars. Okay, uh, we have to move on. Thank you once again. Thank and you. we continue with the second presentation by George Pavlov.